that. And of course, um, send, them, send me questions, send them to Sally actually throughout the program. This we do just kind of stop and start uh, so we can field questions. And, and really, these are just things I have on my agenda, but you really uh, lead the program in whatever direction you want. So just send questions, whatever's on your mind. Of course, uh, azaleas and rhododendrons, they're so well known to everybody throughout the area. It's a big group of plants. Uh, there's over a thousand different species. And because of their popularity, they've been hybridized where we take them, growers take them and they, you know, cross pollinate them, grow them from seedlings, you know, see what comes out of that. This has been going on for decades and decades to the point where there's over 10,000 different varieties out there right now. And some of those are probably fallen out of trade. Some of them are still available and new ones constantly be developed. Most of the time, they're doing this for various flower colors, but as we're going to learn, this also goes into a whole host of different things, um, including their shape, size, bloom time, and so on. So I'm gonna kick this off with a, a little video with Joel Cook. He's one of our nursery managers. And I asked him to give us a little bit of a quick run through on some of the different varieties you may be interested in for your landscape. Hey everybody, it's Joel. Just wanted to uh, give a quick uh, intro to azaleas and that they're more than just, uh, I guess, choosing particular flower colors. It's more than just the flower color that differentiates a lot of these varieties. So I wanted to show that uh, growth habit, flowering time, foliage color, uh, these are all attributes that are, uh, I guess, make all the distinctive uh, characteristics to all the different azaleas. So for instance, you've got Joseph Hill, low growing, late blooming azalea. This is excellent, almost a ground cover application. Won't bloom until probably mid-May. Here's one of your earliest blooming. This is coral bells, beautiful little azalea, small little leaves, nice pink flowers. Here's a great one for foliage color. You can see the variegated leaf. Nice to add a little pop of color with an azalea. This particular one is Christy Lynn. Here's one of my favorites. Stewartsonian, this is another classic, large growing, mid-season blooming red. You can see the nice dark foliage. A lot of the reds turn almost a, a purplish red leaf color in the winter. So not only is it green during the growing season, but azaleas have excellent winter color, whether or not it be purples or reds or yellows or oranges, just something to keep in consideration. Leaf size is another attribute that differentiates some of these uh, azaleas. So you can see the small leaves with coral bells, large leaves with Gerard's rose. And that's what uh, differentiates the Gerard series from a lot of the other azaleas. The large leaves, excellent foliage retention through the winter, uh, and great leaf uh, winter color. Um, and then repeat blooming azaleas. So you're not just getting one bloom per year, you're getting two, sometimes three blooms. There's the Encore Azalea series and the Bloomathon series. They'll bloom spring, sporadically through the summer, and again in the fall. And there are numerous different varieties to choose from different flower colors, different size that they grow. Um, the world of azaleas is limitless. So don't, um, it's not just the flower color that you're choosing. Excellent, because I, I wanted everybody to, to actually be able to see the plants because I, I can't bring them all in here. I just brought this one, Pinot you know, Crimson in to use as an example. Again, this is uh, one that's very, very popular uh, throughout the landscape because it probably gives us one of the truest red colorations that's out there. Uh, but again, there, there's just so many of them. What Joel was showing us and what most of us are growing are the evergreen type of azaleas. Uh, these are all of Asian origin, uh, but there are also deciduous azaleas. There are azaleas that shed their leaves, and that includes some of our native ones because, again, most of these azaleas and rhododendrons, they're growing in parts of um, Asia and out through the Himalayas and India and that region, uh, but they also grow as a native plant here in the Northeast, but those are going to be the deciduous ones that shed their leaves. Um, also, because they're not quite blooming yet. Now, you can see over my shoulder what's called a PJM rhododendron. That's one of our earliest flowering varieties. And as you can see, some of the other uh, early blooming ones are just starting to come into bloom. But when I'm selecting landscape plants, 
I love flowers as much as anybody else does, but this is almost the, the flowering characteristics. Sometimes we're talking about trees and shrubs can almost be secondary because I want to select plants that are gonna be the right size, the right texture um, that match the environment that I have is really my primary concern. And then flower and flower color comes in sort of the secondary one. Uh, but I know most of you come in, start to buy them when they're in bloom, uh, but we're probably a good one or two weeks away from really starting to get into the flowering period on these. And then of course there are early mid season and late flowering varieties. So with proper selection, you can get flowers that are going to go all the way, I'm going to say probably from the first part of April, right up into uh, the middle part of June, this in there. So again, a fascinating group of plants. Now, all of these, they will grow in full shade or they'll grow in full sun. Where they really thrive, where they do their best is somewhere between those extremes, like a morning sun, afternoon shade. If you take azaleas and rhododendrons and you plump them down into full shade, they live, they grow, but they're also thin and sparse and their flowering's not too impressive. You take that same plant and you put it out in full sun, it's denser, it's more compact, it can be prolific in its blooms, but that's also a stressed plant. And in those kind of conditions, uh, they become vulnerable to heat and drought stress. We get leaf scorch where they get stressed. Then we start getting more pest issues showing up with it. So again, highly variable. You'll see them growing in almost any kind of exposure. Like I said, where I think they're going to thrive and do their best is where they're getting bright indirect light, dappled sun, you know, maybe morning sun, but a little bit of shelter from the real intense um, afternoon conditions. The other part that's absolutely critical on these is these plants must have a well-drained soil. Um, particularly in this group of plants like rhododendrons, mountain laurels, for example, will not tolerate wet conditions. That's just the way it is. Um, azaleas are a little bit more forgiving, but with our dense clay soil, I think it's really important that we condition that soil that we amend it with compost. Uh, some acelli growers like to use a lot of pine bark incorporated in there, but any kind of compost helps to break up the soil so we get better infiltration of water through there, better structure that's in, into that soil. And then I even keep them a little bit elevated out of ground just to make sure that I don't get what we call wet feet. Uh, I also, just because I noticed it's sitting here on my left-hand side, that Pierce japonica is also in the same family as azaleas and rhododendrons a different genus, um, but still closely related, wants to be in that same conditions. Um, and again, they also do well with acidic soil conditions. So these are, um, they're not fussy plants, but again, we just like, any, we want to match with good drainage, kind of a part sun. Uh, if we can make sure that soil is acidic, then you can have just, I mean, they can live for decades. I mean, they can live for centuries uh, if we're really lucky. Now, the way they grow, is they actually set their flower buds last year, probably around that August, September time period. So they form flower buds in the late summer. Uh, we go through the winter time. And then now in early spring, as the days are getting longer and, and warmer, those buds begin to open. So that's why you can see like the Paris japonica, which flowers for us usually right in that first week of April comes in. Said the rhododendron, some of the early bloomers are coming in. And then they're going to be followed by as we go continue into April and May. Uh, so we don't do any pruning on these until after the flowering time. If we go in and let's say I start pruning them in, you know, in the winter time or the early spring, you know, you're doing your spring cleanup and you decide to go out, you want to tidy them up and shape them. Well, guess what? You just cut all your flower buds off. So the care, the management of these really begins after the flowering season. So again, I'm gonna go back to a little video to kind of show you an example, you know, what I call the, the proper way, the correct way to be pruning azaleas and rhododendrons. Hi, I'm here to share some tips with you on how to keep your azaleas and rhododendrons looking terrific. As soon as they finish blooming, this is the ideal time to go in and prune and fertilize them. But before we start cutting, 
we need to set some goals and objectives of why we are pruning them. So this plant that we're looking at today is in good health, but it's gotten a little bit overgrown and it's a little bit misshapen. So I'm going to go in and use a technique that I call selective thinning. By reaching down inside the plant and taking selective branches out, it helps to retain the natural form and shape of the plant. I target my cuts to cut where that branch naturally divides or forks. That helps with the plant and the healing process from the pruning and as well as maintaining the natural shape. So when we completed, you look at this and realize I've reduced the size by about 25%, but it still looks like an azalea. Now azaleas respond really well to pruning and you can be as vigorous as you want. You can prune them back to almost any height or shape you need. But with rhododendrons, their close relatives, I have to be a little more stingy with them. I don't like to cut back in the old growth. So I go in, deadhead it, pull off the old spent flower blooms just to make it look prettier. And then again, do a little bit of selective thinning out the tips of the branch to maintain that density. Once we've completed our pruning, this is also the ideal time to fertilize them. I'm using Maryfield flowering plant food, which will help to encourage good, healthy growth, set flower buds later this summer and reward us with gorgeous blooms next spring. Excellent. So I know I'm showing you all this stuff a little bit early, um, you know, talking about their care and all that. Uh, but like I said, I want to give you guys time to get prepared. I, I just forgot. I do have a picture. I want to show that after picture of the azalea that we saw in the video because we'd done that pruning, uh, you know, following the bloom probably around the June time period. But this is the same plant the following spring. So again, that's why I'm just wanting you to see the finished product where by pruning at the right time and doing that selective thinning. You know, we've got a beautiful shape in here and nice density of flowering you can actually improve the condition of. Uh, and then let's go one more picture. Uh, so this I took just a little picture from my own garden. Uh, this is a variety, it's called Chinzan. It's a Satsuki variety, which means basically it's very low growing, a small variety of azalea. Um, it also blooms later. I took this picture, as you can see there, on June 11 uh, last year. So one of the things I kind of realized is that when it's flowering later in the season, was flowering in June, uh, of course that's nice because uh, the others have already faded out, but also the blooms held up really well for a long period of time because a lot of those that are flowering for us in April and May you know, with the frequent rain showers and that kind of thing, you know, the flowers get knocked off or, you know, they get that uh, ovulinia petal blight, which causes them to turn brown. So sometimes the rain showers uh, diminish the length of bloom season. On this, by getting a later flowering variety, when I was able to keep it a little bit out of some of the constant rain, uh, I got, I'm going to say definitely a solid two weeks and maybe even closer to three weeks of bloom out of it. So, so again, you, you need to mix it up. Um, that's kind of my message. I don't even think we have this one in stock right now. So don't get hung up on a particular variety. Just put it out there, give you an idea of some of the different ways you can utilize the plant in the landscape. So let me ask, do we have any uh, questions coming in yet before I switch over to the pest issues? Hey, David. Yeah, we do have questions. Um, and... Uh, if you're going to start with pest issues, we have some, uh, sorry, if you're moving on to pest issues next, we have some questions about transplanting and pruning. Um, and then a couple of people have asked what that earliest blooming variety was that Joel had mentioned. Um, so I'm happy to start on any of those topics if you have a preference. Well, let's, let's talk about pests a little bit later, but let's, let's talk about that pruning, the transplanting, varieties, all that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so what time of year do you usually recommend? So for people to prune since they set their buds before, what is the time frame for when people should be finished, be, should start pruning or then to finish? What's the latest they can go? Yeah, so, so your pruning is done after flowering. As soon as those flowers begin to drop and fade off and they're losing their beauty, uh, you can prune from that time. I really would like to have my pruning finished before the uh, 4th of July. That's, now, these aren't absolute dates, you know, don't, don't get 
gardening is never quite that black and white. But if I have my pruning done, let's say before the 4th of July, that allows a little bit of recovery time for the plant to continue to generate a little bit growth, fill in some pruning and still set flower buds. Um, so, so let's try to get it done in that kind of June time period, you know, late May, you know, somewhere in that time period is ideal. Thank you. And here's a question coming in. Um, so for people who have the encore azaleas that bloom more than just the once, um, when do the, you prune those? Yes, yeah, so that's really, um, I find that interesting. And when these encores first were first introduced, it took me literally a few years to kind of get this figured out. Uh, and what happens is I think we do ourselves a disservice when we call repeat flowering because they don't repeat flower. To me, a rose, like if you prune a rose, right, it blooms, you trim it back, it regrows, it blooms, you trim it back, it regrows and it blooms. The azaleas, and I would say twice blooming azaleas operate differently. What happens is just like any other azalea, uh, if I'm using the Hino Crimson here as an example, so the, the Encore and Bloomathon azaleas, they follow the same life cycle. They, they set their buds usually at late summer. Let's say they set their flower buds in August, early September. And I'm just getting a plant like this. Let's, it might have what, 500, 700 different buds on here. But on the Encore types or Bloomathon types, what will happen if that bud is produced kind of in August, early September, but then as you go into October and November, boom, 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 a pop, you know, a bud here and there opens up. So let's pretend in the fall, 20% of these buds open up. Then we go into winter, we go back into spring, and then the remaining 80% of the flowers bloom. So it's the same plant. We follow the same pruning, the same care guidelines. It's just their flowers open sequentially. Whereas like on, on the traditional azaleas we think of, they explode all in the bloom at the same time. And you get this huge profusion of color. Those encores, they will sequentially open over a period of different seasons. Um, but the treatment, the care form is the same. Other than I will say those, those azaleas, those varieties, they were developed down in Louisiana and hotter, warmer weather, and they do well in a full sun environment. So they take the heat and the dry conditions a little better too. So sometimes that's a, a good option for sunny locations. Thanks, David. Um, we've got a few questions about transplanting. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about if there's an ideal time to transplant um, azaleas or if there's any time of year that they sh it should be avoided? Azaleas to me are one of the easiest plants in the garden to transplant. They have this very fibrous root system. So when you dig them, the root ball holds together really well. Uh, they don't have deeply intent entrenched roots. So, so it's not like you have to dig to China to get them out of the ground. They lift up pretty easily. And I have moved azaleas at all times of the year. I've moved them at the worst possible times. I've moved them in the middle of summer. I've moved them in the middle of winter. Um, so don't really hesitate. Um, to, to transplant them. Now, having said that, probably the ideal best time to move them would be in the early spring. I would say right in the, that, let's say March time period, maybe early. I know, I know they got buds on. Sometimes I don't like to plants, move plants when they're flowering, but I'd say before they bloom in March or maybe after they flower in May. But, but that's, but take a lot of liberty with that. Uh, I, the one thing I'd say is if you're transplanting late in the season, they're evergreen, you gotta keep an eye on the watering, but you would do that anytime. When you transplant it, it's a new plant, you're now responsible for keeping it watered, but super easy to move. Thanks, David. Um, all right, so here's a question about some people who have older azaleas in the landscape. Um, if someone trims or prunes their azaleas every year after they bloom, they've been maintaining them for a while. Um, over the years, they've noticed that, that some of the larger branches have just begun to die. Um, is that something that they can fix or is that just the aging of the plant? Can you talk a little bit about older azalea plants and if there's any different care that's needed for those? 
of one one thing I'll say is if if they're being sheared, where where like I was trying to show in the video, where you're thinning them by hand, when you're thinning the plant, you're opening it up. Uh, more sun gets in there, better air circulation, and the plant gets a chance to kind of rejuvenate, renew itself from inside. So that's one of the reasons I prefer that. If they're just being sheared to the same size each and every year, sometimes they get this sort of outer layer of green, but they don't have any growth on the interior. And you might need to go in there and do occasionally a thinning cut. But again, with this alias, you can cut back into old woody stems where you don't see any signs of growth and they're capable of renewing themselves and sprouting even out of that old wood. So. I'd, I'd say, hey, hang tight, enjoy the flowering season. At the end of the season, go in there, thin them out. Uh, the other thing, and we'll talk about that a little, a little bit later in the show, azaleas are susceptible to a couple different diseases. And on some older declining plants, um, we'll find a, a fungal infection that's called Thermopsis. But again, that's something I would rather you bring pictures and samples into the clinic and get a clear diagnosis on it. Because if it is a pathogen, we're gonna have you do a combination of pruning to cut the dead stuff out along with treating with a fungicide to get the disease under control. And I find that some pretty frequently in older declining plants, but that's something you'd actually have. We can't do in a virtual plant clinic. That's something you gotta come and do a real plant clinic on that one. Thanks, David. Um, all right, so it looks like we've got um, a few questions about fertilizing. Uh, so I don't know if you wanna get into that or if you'd like to go ahead and move on, um, but we've covered pretty much looks like all the questions on pruning and transplanting that have come in at the moment. So with fertilizing, uh, again, you, the, the whole life cycle of the plant, they bloom, that's what we call a determinate growth habit. You know, they, they, let's say they bloom in April and then they grow in May, June, July, set their buds in August. So it's the spurt of growth that happens all, it, it culminates when it sets a terminal bud. So we want to fertilize at the beginning of that growth cycle. So all this happens after they're flowering. Uh, so you, you guys sit tight, you enjoy the show. Once the flowering is over, then you do your pruning, do your fertilizing. Uh, you can use a Maryfield flowering plant food. It's perfectly suitable for azaleas and rhododendrons. Um, a lot of people like to use holly tone. That's why I brought this in. This is kind of a, when I say specialty fertilizer, it acidifies the soil, which I've mentioned plants in this family like the acidity of it, and it's an organic fertilizer. So this is also a very popular choice um, for azaleas, rhododendrons, as well as hollies, pierce japonica, blueberries, and Heather and many other plants in that family. All right, you want to talk about some of the ugly stuff, some of the insects and diseases? We've definitely got questions coming in about that, so we're happy to start okay. jumping into that whenever you're ready. Let's let's go. I'm going to start this with a little bit of a picture. I'm only going to talk about a couple of them, but we're going to start talking with the azalea lace bug. Uh, azalea lace bug. I mentioned this because it's probably the most common and widespread of pests. I hope none of you, I hope your azaleas don't look like this, um, but we do see quite a few samples in there that just, um, when it's a really bad infestation, uh, the plants just look like they're bleached out. They just don't have the green color on it. And I put two pictures on there, one that shows the top of the leaf where you just see where it's lost all of its color. And the other picture where you're looking at the underside of the leaf, you're looking at all those spots and specks and, and all that dirty looking mess in there. So this is an insect that's called the azalea lace bug. Um, they are not active yet. They have not hatched out at this time of year, but this will all start happening soon. Um, so the eggs, let's say they hatch out later this month at the end of April, uh, maybe May, depending on the, the weather, how warm it is. The eggs will hatch out and then the, the nymph, the little immature insect, its mouth is like a little needle and it keeps poking the leaf, it goes pokey, 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 and it's stabbing the leaf with its little mouth and it's sucking the juice out of the plant. So every time they bite that leaf, they suck a the little juice out of there and it starts to lose the color. One thing I like to always let people know is once they have done that, that damage is irreversible. That leaf will not green up again. 
So even if we go into a treatment program, that leaf is kind of permanently discolored, but we can easily manage this pest and then the new growth resumes normal color. Now with lace bug, we usually have about three generations a year. So let's say they start hatching out the end of the month and then they mate, they lay eggs, they have babies then they continue the cycle, then they mate, they lay eggs, and then they continue the cycle. So this will start in late spring and it goes all the way to the end of summer. Now, the good news is this is pretty easy thing to treat. Uh, I'm just showing this as one example. Uh, I do think that we need to use a systemic insecticide in this case, a systemic insecticide that's absorbed into the leaf tissue um, and then it kills the lace bugs as they're feeding in there. Uh, David, can you tell us the name of that product? Since we've got the pictures up right now, you're a little bitty picture. Well, I chose this okay. really, yeah, this one is just called systemic insect spray. Systemic insect uh, spray. All right. Thank right. you. Now, there are different ones in the market, um, you know, depending on the size. I brought this because if I had a large collection of this alias, if I had a big hedge or a big garden with a lot of them, a lot of lace bug problems, this one you can attach to the end of your hose and then spray over a big group of plants. You can also buy this in little squirt bottles. You can buy it um, in concentrates to mix your own. But the thing that's important is that it is absorbed into the leaf tissue because otherwise, if you're trying to use soaps and oils and some of the natural alternatives, you really need to reach and get under the leaf. And a lot of things you read might make that sound easy, but as somebody that's cared for azaleas for many years, trying to spray the underside of the leaf on a densely grown azalea is not an easy thing to do. So I, I really recommend the systemics. Um, but but again, let's um, we're always here at the clinic, you know, so we can get a confirmation. On. That's a pretty easy one to diagnose. It's pretty widespread. Uh, I'm kind of rambling on, but I just have to say one of the things that we find is the azaleas become more susceptible to this pest when let's say they're planted out in an island planting in the full hot sun. If I put this plant out in a stressful environment, uh, it becomes more susceptible to it. And there's been some really good studies that show in that kind of a landscape where I don't have a diverse planting and I don't have natural predators around these populations explode out of control. If you are growing azaleas in a more naturalized woodland garden, where I've got a diverse community of plants and environments and a better situation for my azaleas, natural predators such as garden spiders, which not everybody likes seeing spiders, but spiders are phenomenal predators. And they usually keep this lace bug problem under control. So again, where you plant and how you plant your garden has a big influence as well. Um, that's all I want to say, and probably more than I plan on saying about lace bug. Here's the the big, uh, my biggest uh, concern. I'm going to say on this group of plants, it's actually it's a disease. Uh, it's called Phytophthora root rot. Um, this is a pathogen that's called a water mold. It's not a true fungus. It's more closely related to algae. Its structure is different from than fungi. And when it does produce spores, these spores actually have a little flagella, they're mobile. They swim and migrate and move through a film of water that's in soil to infect plants. That's why I'm so adamant about having really good drainage on these conditions. Uh, because this pathogen, it will affect over a thousand different plant species. So it's, and it's in your soil, it's in my soil, um, it's in Sally's, soil, it's just a part of our ecology. So the, the pathogen is present wherever you live, but when we have the combination of kind of wet, poorly drained conditions, i.e. dense clay, and in this case, particularly rhododendrons and mount laurels are pretty highly susceptible to it. So when I put those three things together, saying poor drainage, highly susceptible species, and the pathogens all there, this becomes a, a frequent thing. And what it will show up on is the plant just looks like it's wilting. That's why I chose that picture of a rhododendron. It looks like it needs water. 
and many times our initial reaction is, well, I need to go water the plant, but the watering actually makes it worse. And there's really no other visible symptoms. To confirm this, what happened, but this is, we've already given up in the tree. They show that other slide. We have to kind of cut under the bark, look at the inner tissue that's in there. And I start to see that dark brown cinnamon colored staining that's in there. Um, if we're at that point, you know, where, you know, it's that level of infestation, we're probably just gonna lose the plant anyway. Um, so our real solution to this, you know, first and foremost is having well-drained soil conditions. Secondly, if um, we catch it in time, if we catch it when let's say I've got 10%, 15% dieback, I've had some good success using this product uh, as a treatment. Again, this one is called Garden Foss. Um, and it can be applied because we're dealing with root rot diseases. This is actually mixed into a, a watering can uh, according to instructions, and we treat the root system with it. It's not a cure, it's not a fix, uh, but it's a treatment that will last for about 30 days. If your plant's responding well and it looks good, um, then we can just repeat the treatment until the plant gets back on its feet. Maybe we get a little closer look at that. Um, but that again, uh, that's something we go to after we're in trouble. Our goal, like with these classes and these conversations, is to try to stay out of trouble uh, by using good cultural practices. All right, so that's what I had to share today. Do we have any questions? We definitely do. Um, all right, so back to some questions about uh, some of the diseases. Um, if you see a plant that has leaves that are going brown, um, but your other plants are fine in the area. How do you recommend figuring out what that is? Would you would you know what that is right off the bat? Would you suggest sending some pictures into the plant clinic? So one one of the things that happens of uh, and and you know how it is. I, again, I keep saying every, every single thing I tell you are there. There's going to be exceptions to every kind of guideline rule, but normally. Normally, if there's an environmental stress, um, let's pretend, what was it? A week ago, we went down to 27 degrees. So if I had, for example, this PGM rhododendron behind me, they're in bloom. If I had three of those in my garden, we have cold temperatures, and then the next day, all three of them kind of look shriveled and damaged. Um, that's usually environmental stress. If I have let's say a drainage problem, and I've got three plants there, you would typically expect that to affect all three plants. So the very fact that you're saying, hey, this is one out of a group, that somewhat implies that maybe we're dealing with a pest issue or what we call a biotic problem. Maybe this is an insect disease or something of that nature. So that's why I ask you to bring pictures because I want to know what the pattern is in there. Also, um, biotic problems like insect and diseases, they typically progress over time. They don't show up instantly. Um, like I had a customer sending me pictures of their arborvitae. They were looking beautiful when they left town for a week. When they came back, they looked horrible. Well, that's because while they were out of town, the deer came in and decimated them. Diseases are gonna progress gradually over time. So these are all kinds of things we study in our diagnostic stuff, but then I still need really samples to look at and confirm that. But the fact that it's happening on one plant, and if it continues to progress, makes me think we're probably dealing with a pest issue. And that means it's time for you to bring pictures and samples into the clinic and talk with one of our specialists. Thanks, David. And that actually brings up a good question that someone else had asked. They uh, sent in a note asking um, how they can stop the deer from pruning their azaleas. Yeah. Um, so no really good answers on that. Of course, um, fencing is probably the best, most reliable option, but a seven foot fence really isn't in the cards for many of us. Um, so that puts you towards the repellent area. Some of our best repellents have been liquid fence or Bobex, but that's still something that you kind of need to apply monthly, you know, so that becomes just another chore that you have to deal with. Uh, 
beyond that, I don't really have any great uh, suggestions for you. Because what's annoying, typically they don't, they don't chew them to the ground, but they chew all your flower buds off and you're just kind of left with an azalea or a rhododendron with no blooms. And that, that kind of, that's not a real exciting thing there either, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. Um, okay, the next question is from someone who planted azaleas on a slope. Um, so the azaleas that are at the top of the slope look great. The azaleas at the bottom of the slope, so it's a wetter area, they're not doing as well. And they said the soil is pretty alkaline. So is there anything that they can do for those azaleas in the wetter area at the bottom of the slope when well, it's, it's soil and it's more alkaline? It's pretty easy to change the pH of the soil by adding sulfur. Uh, you know, we might want to double check the pH, but usually we're, oh, we might be looking at something like, you know, five pounds, you know, you know, or, or let's say, um, I hate giving rates without knowing our pH, but, you know, it might be something like, you know, uh, a pound per hundred square feet or something like that to change the pH. And, and we should look into that to make the best conditions possible. Drainage is a tougher issue. Um, it's something that we can address ahead of time before they're planted. Um, but once they're already installed, that's more difficult because sometimes if I know I have a drainage problem and I want to plant something that's susceptible to uh, wet soil issues, there's a material called permatill. Um, it's rock that they excavate in North Carolina. They put it in the kiln under very high temperatures. So it comes out looking like fine gravel, but it's also porous, like lava rock is. I've had some really, really good success amending poorly drained soils with permatill that then allows me to plant sensitive plants in that area. But that's all hindsight. Uh, so short of digging up the plants and reconditioning the soil, again, you know, I, I don't know that I have a great answer for you on that. Thanks, David. Um, when For people who are planting azaleas for the first time, how much space do they need to grow? Does that depend on the type that you're planting or is there a general rule? Of uh, it really depends on the type you're planting. That little one, again, people know I'm in a little townhouse garden. I have limited space. That grows about two, maybe three inches a year and will over the next 15 years get three, maybe four feet apart, but that's one end of the spectrum. There are other, there's azaleas that, you know, you give them long enough, I mean, they can grow 12, 14, 15 feet tall and wide, but that's the other extreme. As a kind of general rule, most of our landscape azaleas, we're putting a mainware from like four feet apart is probably a good general number, but again, that, that number can change dramatically depending on the time frame that you're looking at and the exact varieties that you want to grow. But, but a lot of people end up in that four foot, um, maybe five foot spacing, depending on which one and, and how much time you want to allow for them to fill in. Thanks, David. So now I suppose the opposite question is for people who have really old overgrown azaleas, um, if they want to rejuvenate those plants, how is there a technique for pruning those back? How aggressive can they be or do they need to be? And you can get really aggressive on azaleas with pruning, even old plants, meaning that if you look at an azalea, you know, like a lot of plants, you know, all the green leaves are on the outside, and then it's just old woody growth on the inside. Even if you cut all of the green off and you just kind of went back to where it's just, let's say, two feet tall or something like that, basically looks like a stump, that plant will sprout new growth and come back. So that's, that's again, that's the most extreme. I'm not saying you have to do that, but you could take that and cut it down, say it's only like 12 or 24 inches tall, might be one extreme, or you might um, just take 25 or 30% off of it. But, but even if they're really old, they're overgrown um, and you're just ready to go for it, you know, enjoy the flowers this month. And then as soon as they're done flowering, you can go ahead and cut them back, like I said, down 12, you know, 16 inches tall, something like that, and they will sprout back. Oh, here's an interesting question. Do azaleas have any kind of a lifespan? Um, I know we're talking about older azaleas, but is there a, an expectancy if you know your azaleas are a certain amount of, you know, number of years old that you just need to be prepared, maybe it's time to replace them? 
Uh, not, not really. Now, if and I again, I talk extremes, you know, because hey, the, the plant, you know, each year it's growing, and the, you know, from the day it's born to the day it dies and stuff. You know, I've got a friend who, a botanist who studies uh, rhododendrons out in the Himalayas, and there really can be tree form. I mean, the size of trees that just dwarf her under them. And some of them can literally be hundreds of years old. Now that's in their native undisturbed habitat with no stresses at all. Most of us in a suburban urban landscape, because it's not a stress-free free world, uh, to me, I still put azaleas in and think it's very reasonable to expect 30, 40 years out of them uh, as a reasonable expectation. And you can find old public gardens where they've been around for over 100 years. Yeah, we actually have one in Florida that was planted back in the Depression era in the 1920s. So they're 100 years old as alias now, which is kind yeah, of- exactly. It really just depends on the- yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you put them in the right environment, you know, they, hey, like ourselves, you know, you take good care of yourself, you know, maybe you'd live to be 100, you know, not that we get there. Yeah. Um, okay, so we had um, a couple of questions coming in um hang on a second oh man um okay so actually let's ask the, i'll go ahead and ask the one while i'm looking for this that was about the cicadas so a lot of people are concerned obviously about the cicadas so is there anything that people need to be worried about for their azaleas no uh they don't bother azaleas or rhododendron so uh, that's one thing i'd like to say is they really don't bother any of the evergreens uh if you're a mama is it a mama cicada, what you're doing, you're looking for a little twig that's about the diameter of a pencil. Um, if it's smaller than that, it's not going to work. If it's bigger than that, it's not going to work. So they're going after, primarily, they're going after deciduous trees, I guess, and some of the larger shrubs that have twigs that are about the diameter of a pencil. Um, again, they don't kill plants. They're going to go in there and she cuts a little groove, makes a little insert and creates a nest to lay her eggs in. And most of the time those just seal up and there's really no harm done. But if she decides to lay several, make several little nests in there, make several of these little cuts, that can be enough to kill the twig. Um, so on plants like I had a customer just, just before class came in, she had a, a lilac, a sapling that a friend of hers, na her neighbor had given her. This is a tiny little sapling lilac from her neighbor's yard that's no bigger than the diameter of a pencil. Now that plant is at high risk. And that one, I'm gonna say, he definitely needs protected by putting a net or a, a mesh over it, you know, or sheltered location. But on larger established plants, uh, the damage is really insignificant. But if you've got really special plants, you know, either they're in memory of somebody or you just spent a small fortune on it, you know, really high value, then you're gonna to need to to put some type of protective netting over them. Really, they're gonna be most active in the month of May, but you could see them from late April all the way to the end of June. Thanks, David. All right, I know it's 2.45, so we have one more question um, that we've had a few people write in about. Um, do you have any recommendations for fertilizing, sorry, not fertilizing, mulching around the azaleas? Uh, Again, mulch is good, you know, helps conserve moisture, keep weeds down, et cetera, et cetera, but you can have too much of a good thing. Because they are sensitive to drainage, to me, I'm totally fine with one, maybe two inches of mulch over there. Uh, my preferred one, and I'm not gonna say this is absolute, but as I like the pine bark mulch, the Virginia Fines with probably my first choice. Um, further south is an this is an excellent choice, but some gardeners we use around here are the pine needles uh, because that stays nice and loose and well aerated. Uh, sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll grow in shredded hardwood, but, you know, shredded hardwood can get matted down, gets a little dense. So that's why I'd rather use pine bark or even pine needles would be my first choice. Thanks, David. Um, we had someone ask where you got your cute gorilla mug. Um, <laughs> I That's my mascot. <laughs> That's my that. mascot, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, uh, you, that, you've had that mug at least as long as I've been working for the Garden Center. Um, this is a custom, custom mug, customized by my colleagues. It was given to me by a good friend, Meryl. Uh, Meryl Olmstead works here, but then some of my 
colleagues have customized it with the googly eyes. <laughs> you can't find this in any store or any place. It's one of a kind. <laughs> so funny. I didn't realize that I had the googly eyes on it. Actually, I haven't seen it in a while. Um, all right. Well, it's 246. Um, so just want to let everybody know if you did not get your questions answered today, please feel free to send us an email. Um, for those of you who are on Zoom, you can hit reply uh, and send an email directly to me. If you're watching us on Facebook, you can actually go to the contact us page on our website. You can send us a Facebook message um, as well, but it may take us a little bit longer to get to that just because it's peak uh spring right now the store is really busy so email might be faster um but feel free to contact us that way um david is there anything that you'd like to close us with before we conclude uh just a couple little teasers uh because again one of uh one of my colleagues here uh linda grows beautiful flowers so she she loaned me this little uh, bouquet with the camellias which are in bloom they are in the tea family. They get this, everything I just said about azaleas and rhododendrons, the care, the culture applies to camellias as well, but they are in a different family. And I think next week, I'm gonna share some uh, thoughts about native plants. Or right. next two weeks from now. Two weeks from now, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, everybody. Keep an eye out for any new classes that are coming up. Um, we will have some updates for the virtual plant clinic schedule soon, and we have our online classes available on our website. Um, so thank you to everybody who joined us, whether you're on Zoom or on Facebook. David, thank you so much for addressing this topic today, and everybody have a good afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Bye.